Dr. Jeremiah Weinstock, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Well, well so I... I, I, I met you. Uh, well, we're, we're part of both part of Division 50 addiction psychology, but I first became acquainted with your your level of expertise around gambling when I watched your continuing education talk that our organization does through the TPN Health Platform. And I was watching it. And at the time, I was working with some clients of my own who were struggling with gambling and just thought, oh, man, like not, not only do we have Gambling Awareness Month coming up, uh, we're Recording this during Gambling Awareness Month, but this is such a growing issue that I feel like so so many folks don't have the in depth knowledge about that. What what better person to ask about in terms of how how to understand everything that's going on uh, the, than yourself? So to get things started, we I think when we look around, we see so much more going on right now in the world of gambling. And just to, to start broad for a second. Why why is it so prevalent right now? Why does it seem like more people are struggling with gambling? How, how did we get here? You know, gambling, it's been with us since the beginning of time. I mean, I think that's the first thing. It's part of the human experience. If like, you know, um, dice were found in the tombs of the Pharaoh, right? Um, you know, there are stories from ancient times of the, the Hindu text, the Mahabharata, which is um, it predates the Bible, basically. And it, it tells the story of a guy who gambled excessively and lost his kingdom and his wife. Um, and, and, his, and I said wife there. And so it, and, and, and leads to a explicit prohibition in ancient times against gambling within Hindu culture. And so it's long been part of the human experience. And in the United States, you know, um, lotteries were, were around back in the day, Harvard University back in the day, went before in the 1700s, hit some tough times and raised some money through a lottery um, to fund some some building acquisition and, and general running of the university. But, you know, it wasn't until, you know, in, in the night, you know, Las Vegas has always been around since it was created. But gambling was really restricted until the 1960s just to the horse track. So a bunch of, you know, and it was primarily men who gambled at that time. You know, and then along came New Hampshire in 1960, 64, somewhere early 60s and said, you know, let's do a lottery again and we're going to fund, you know, um, education and senior services. And so it was a source of revenue for for states. And so that is from there, from early 60s, gambling has been expanded because it's a wonderful way for states to raise revenue without raising taxes. So they can get a new pot of money that they can then spend on social programs or other things um, and so we have gone from there's a big expansion of um, lotteries, then all of a sudden proliferate 60s, 70s. And says today there's lotteries available in every state except for Utah and Hawaii. Um, and then there's a big expansion of um, casino gambling outside of Las Vegas and Atlantic City that got us there. So that was a big expansion. And along the way, it was also Native American tribes were allowed to offer uh, casino gambling. And that was, again, late 80s, early 90s, and it was a way of an e economic development tool for them. And it's actually been a very successful economic development tool for them. Um, there's a really interesting study that was done on the eastern band of the Cherokees in, uh, on the Tennessee, North Carolina, in the Smokies, essentially, border, where they brought in a, a casino. And there was some researchers there who were um, studying sort of child psychopathologies, child mental health issues. And they mm -hmm. collected like the prevalent study of mental health problems. And then um, the casino came along and what those casinos at the time were doing were generating payments directly to members of the tribe. So it was an economic development tool. And then they did another study, uh, prevalent study of, of just mental health concerns. And what they found was so cool was that actually, the, you know, there's no changes in like serious mental illness or depression, anxiety. But within the Native American children, there was a significant decrease in the rates of conduct disorder and oppositional deviance disorder. These are like childhood disorders that kind of set you up for any social personality disorder later on down the road, but there's significant reductions. Meanwhile, in the surrounding white communities or it's primarily white communities, but the surrounding non-Native um, American communities, those rates of conduct and oppositional deviance disorder stayed the same. And what they figured out was the researchers was that parents went from working two and three jobs down to one job, and then they had this payment. So they could be more involved in their children's lives. There was more supervision. There was more monitoring. There was just more engagement. And so rates of oppositional defiance dropped dramatically. So in some ways, that expansion of gambling was really helpful and productive for one community. Um, so it's been an mm -hmm. economic development tool um, in other parts of the country. 
Um, so there's a rapid expansion of casino gambling in the 80s and 90s, um, even in 2000s. And then came along sports betting in 2017-18 when the Supreme Court legalized um, the states, gave states the right to legalize sports betting. And now we're, we're at 35, 38 states, somewhere in that number now in less than five, like basically five years. Um, and there's huge, you know, markets for, for sports betting now all across the U.S. So, so question for you then, and I know this is kind of a little bit of a leading question. So, so, so what's the downside that, so we, we talk about how you can use it as a, like a stimulus tool. You could use it to help raise up communities potentially with payments. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously this, this is not just free money. There, there is a cost to producing the revenue, mm -hmm. uh, potentially arguably why there were these restrictions in place beforehand. So yeah. what, what's the argument then to restricting gambling if we could just relax the restrictions and make so much mm -hmm. more money off of it? I mean, because it's an economic development tool, there, there are good jobs that come out of this. There's the, um, you know, there's also the tax revenue that legislatures see um, or state governments see. It's not just the legislature, it's the governor too who has to approve it. So there, there are those things. And it's also like, it's America, like, let's have some fun. Um, and so, you know, we, we move that way um, in terms of like saying this is no longer considered a sin or a moral vice. Um, you know, our society has evolved in terms of how we, what we consider and what are the norms around gambling. Um, and so that's been this, the, I think the big change there. And, and then when they have legalized it, you know, they've been like, oh, this isn't so bad, right? And, and you know, it only harms one or 2% of the population. So, you know, we'll set aside some money for them so they're okay, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so there has been that. I mean, I will say, I was one of my first gambling conferences way back in the day, um, the CFO at the time of Harris got up and said, you know, and this is back in, this is, you know, they, now it's much a much bigger dollar figure. But he goes, you know, we build these 300 to $500 million casino resort properties. They're not built off the money of the winners, right? So the money, yeah. right? The money is coming from somewhere. And when I work with gambling clients, and they they go to casinos and gamble, I ask them to, to tell me what what have they bought and paid for there? You know, like are they, have mm -hmm. they paid for that expansion or this expansion? Like, just please identify that for me. Just help make it real for those folks. Right. Well, well, and I, I think that to me that's the central question, and I know why I'm I'm concerned about it because yes, there's absolutely benefits to making money and then say to pushing it back into social programs. Uh, but the question is who, who is it harming, right? You mentioned like those one to 2% of people who have a problem. I, I know that, and again, this is just my bent. I, I think those people matter, you know, particularly oh, as those, sure. are, and I, I know you, I know you agree with that. You, you spend your, a lot of time working with those folks as well. I think that though is the question, right? About how do we balance money versus public mm -hmm. health, public health, I, you know, and I, it, it goes back to, all the way to ancient Greek society when they used to debate, you know, what's for the common good and, and what, how much can you, if it harms a little bit, of, you know, this sort of thing versus it has all these big benefits, like, can we offset these things? And so we, we've long struggled with this and, and I, I, there is so much room to grow and to recognize, to even acknowledge that there's harms going on. And for a long time, longest time, the industry, the gaming industry, and that's the word they used to describe themselves as the gaming industry really did not want to have conversations about that the product was harmful. Um, they have mm -hmm. really evolved and it's still changing. And um, they now have some responsible gaming, you know, efforts of, of you know, it's very similar to, hey, drink responsibly, like, you know, and, and that has, it's a starting place. Um, it's, it's saying this product can be harmful. This can be damaging to you. Um, you know, it puts the onus on the individual. <laughs> which we know that individuals operate within systems that are much larger and there are other things going on. Um, and do they also have a duty to identify whether someone who's using their product is doing so in a harmful way? Do they have that responsibility? Yeah. And currently we in America say, no, they don't have that responsibility. Um, yeah. you know, that's something that potentially I is a conversation that I would like to at least begin to have and to question like, do they have the responsibility and, and what are the ways they, they could or, or what and what are the ways if they did, what is their responsibility in terms of intervening? Every once in a while, it's really mm -hmm. interesting. You'll see somebody with a gambling problem sue the, a, a casino or some other you know gaming in, in, industry, industry entity. 
And, and it's always basically, you knew I had a gambling problem and you encouraged me and you, you, you fed me free comps and you gave me free hotel rooms and you wanted me to keep coming. You gave me $50 in free slot play. You knew I had a problem. You know, I'm not responsible for this bets. Uh, and yeah. most recently this happened actually in New Jersey. And, um, the, if you go and read the actual ruling by the judge, the judge is starting to say, until the legislature says, until our laws say that these companies have a responsibility to know and identify individuals with gambling problems, we can't do anything. Nope, mm -hmm. it's not it's not their responsibility. So therefore, they can't be held liable. Right? I, it's I really, think it's interesting because it's finally a judge who's saying before it was like, get out. These cases would be thrown out. They wouldn't even be heard. Now this was heard. And the judge now is saying, you know, we finally have a, a, a judge who's saying, you know what, until our legal framework changes, our hands are tied. They, they, they're not liable. He's right, at least right. opening the door to the idea. Well, I, I think it's a fascinating idea in part because, um, and I were jumping around in my outline a little bit, but I think this is a smooth transition, uh, is is that some of the tactics that I see going on, right? Or even if we think about the data that these, uh, particularly ones that are digital, right? That are online app-based, that they have access to. So there are patterns of losses that one could not sustain without reasonably having a suspicion that someone has a problem gambling disorder. Right. Uh, so something that comes to mind as well, you know, you mentioned that, that that catchphrase of drink responsibly always hit me almost as like I ironic because of the data we have that shows that the that the biggest alcohol companies make se uh, potentially even 75 percent of their revenue off of the highest utilizers, the people who are, are consuming the most. So if everyone drank responsibly, we probably wouldn't have Anheuser-Busch. We probably wouldn't have Coors. And the gentleman you spoke about earlier who said, we don't build this resort on the backs of the winners, right? I mean, you're basically coming out and saying it. One tech, so, so one thing in particular, right? When you think about like, what's the responsibility? I think one of the more egregious elements of this that I've seen was I was working with a gentleman at one point who wanted to self exclude from a, a, a betting app that he was using. Yeah. Um, and for those listeners who aren't familiar with that term, that means basically banning yourself from using it. And so he, you know, he finally got himself to the point where he said, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to self exclude. So he, he goes through the process and he, he gets a response that says, Hey, we see you want to self exclude. So instead of doing that for you, we're going to give you a 24 hour cooling off period. So you can really think about if this is what you really want to do. And then if you come back and say you want to do it again, then we will let you do it. And to me, I was like, man, that seems so predatory. That seems so predatory. <laughs> Especially if there's also they get he separately then gets an email saying, "Hey, here's fifty dollars in free bets." You know, um, you know. Yeah. I have a client who um, also struggles with sports betting. Was doing a lot with apps, and and he's in a state where it's legal. So he he engaged in in self exclusion. And it was nice. Now it used to be self exclusion was only for your lifetime. Nowadays, <laughs> self exclusion there are various time frames that you can ban yourself depending on the state. Each state has its own regulatory framework. But some states, it can be you can ban yourself six months, you can ban yourself a year, you can do three years, five years. And so it's not mm -hmm. this all or nothing thing, which is really wonderful. Um, except for he also gambled on what we call illegal sites. So they're not the state um, licensed sites. And um, and you need and there's like and he was tried to go ban himself. And A, there's not even that option. And when he emailed them specifically through their customer service line, say, hey, I'd like to self exclude. He did get that email. Um, it's basically saying, here's $50 or a hundred dollars in risk-free bets. You know, and he's like, I'm trying to do this. Right. So there yeah. is, there, there are elements that are unsavory. I would say in the industry, there are starting to really recognize that these aren't good customers. And you're right. There is that, you know, marketing talked about 80, 20, like, you know, 80% of your revenues come from 20% of your users, you know, yeah. and gambling, we, we suspect, and, and there is some evidence to suggest that that's true is here as well. You know, mm -hmm. and so it is, it's, we, we have to really have, and the thing is, because this is all state by state, there is not a national regulatory framework and, and, and the industry doesn't want a national framework in many ways because they're, it's yeah. a lot harder to influence than at the state level, I think. And, and maybe that's me being a little bit, um, a negative view, but, but, you know, then it's a very patchwork and it's not consistent. And so what I say here may not apply when if you're living in New Jersey or if you're living in Missouri or Washington right. State. You know, it's very different. Well, and I, to be honest with you, I think the slight tinge of cynicism is warranted. I think that, that we've seen over and over again when you cross 
so, so addiction is is the only type of behavioral health problem that I'm aware of that people try to sell you. You know, and I think mm -hmm. that that creates a very different sort of dynamic, right? Like no one's selling yeah. depression or anxiety per se. Um, yeah. But but when you have that 80-20 rule and you have a, have a behavior or you have a substance mm -hmm. that could potentially really loot people in, that creates very uh, unsavory to use your word profit incentives. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting because there's there um, you know other other countries, other regulatory frameworks. There are there is some social responsibility involved or, or and corporate responsibility if you want to use that word in America. So there's a study. Um, there's a, a gentleman, um, a big researcher up at the University of Cal Calgary. His name is David Hodgins, and he had a study it's called Biggest Losers. Um, and he he partnered with a Norwegian company that was a gambling company, and they basically contacted their biggest losers. They're 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 one percenters. They're whales, and gave them feedback on their behavior. Said you're one you're one percent, and here's how much you've lost. Think about yeah. it. That was their letter. They just sent him a letter. Said, think about it. We're going to give you a call in two weeks to talk about this. Two weeks later, they call up somebody from their own that they employ. And David had trained them in motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing, for those who don't know, is a psychological intervention where you help people resolve ambivalence around potential behavior change. And then you seek to in increase intrinsic motivation. And so he had taken these lay, not, not mental health clinicians. This is customer service reps. And trained them in the basics of motivational interviewing. And then they called them up and said, hey, you know, we gave you this information. What do you think about it? You know, you're somebody who loses a lot of money on, on our platform. And um, and if they said, like, hung up on them or, or didn't respond, they were like, fine, you know. But if they if they wanted to engage in a conversation, they, they would have them on the phone for 20 minutes kind of talking about gambling and where it fit in with their lifestyle. And what they found was is there was a significant reduction in those people's gambling behavior over time. So, and it didn't necessarily significantly change the profit and loss statement for that, for that company. So there are models out mm. there. There's a, another study that also is really cool. This is a recent study. That one was like 2019, it's pre-pandemic. Um, you know, I can't see that study happening here in America. I'll tell you that. Um, there's another study that was done here in America. There's, um, so there's lots of different businesses that are involved in the gambling world, especially on the technology side. And so uh, these gambling apps, the sports betting apps and other ones, they, they kind of subcontract with different providers. So there's this one company that is responsible for handling the transaction from your bank account to getting the money into the, the gambling app. So basically the transfer between the two bank accounts, your bank account versus the app's bank account. And they handed this data all on transactions back and forth. So both going both ways, me putting money in and me extracting money when I win or if I just want to take the money out that I've deposited. And they looked at, um, they did some, basically what's called cluster analysis, which is a way of grouping different people together based on different behavioral patterns. And they were able to, just with those transactions, to be, to identify high-risk people, you know, and mm -hmm. to start to say, we don't know if they have a gambling problem because they didn't couldn't give them a gambling problem measure, like a problem gambling measure. But they said, you know, all of a sudden there's a huge uptick in how much you're depositing. Or you're not taking anything back. It's all only going one way. You know, these yeah. sorts of behavioral markers, and that's just on the transaction data. So we can begin to have this conversation, though, that you're talking about of like, who might be starting to experience some problems? Or who might we begin to say, you know, you might want to take a closer look at your gambling behavior. See if it fits in with your values and your priorities. Yeah, well, well absolutely. And it, it strikes me that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, purveyors of this who, who go in the opposite direction where you like reach higher tiers, like like gold tier, platinum yes. tier, as in, and you're even more incentivized to lose more versus mm -hmm. being marked as like, hey, there might be a problem here and we want We want to help them. I mean, that, that's a oh, oh, go go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna say, what you said earlier, though, about these companies are data companies really is what they are. You know, and uh, 60 Minutes just recently did a piece on sports betting and they had a person from the UK get on there and talk about what's going on over in, in the UK. And and his point was, is these are data companies. These companies know everything about your life, all sorts of things. And they have all this gambling behavior data, too. So I think that's what the field is starting to really, you know, grapple with is we live in a data world now, you know, and so they do have this information and do they have a responsibility to look at the information besides just to make you gold, silver, platinum, double diamond level? 
Yeah, let's just let's just feed it. Let's get someone feeling good about how much money they're losing, so they so they do more. But so that's that's a good segue into the question I think that a lot of folks are wondering, which is, how do you know when gambling behavior has become become problematic? Because obviously a lot of people can gamble; they wouldn't define it as a problem. But maybe yeah. they and, wouldn't. And maybe they love do. Most people gamble, yeah. and it's a recreational activity, and it's a source of fun and interest and way to spice things up a little bit or get a little action, right? Um, where it really starts, it's about the money. I mean, it's money and relationships is where we start to see, um, you know, or actually I'm just going to say functioning, right? When it impacts your functioning. So that's relationships. Are you hiding this from other people? You know, are you, um, and it's not only the money, it's time. Are you hiding the time? Like, oh, I, I, you know, I had car trouble, so I couldn't get to Johnny's soccer game. You know, but really I was at the casino, right? Um, mm -hmm. Are you jeopardizing, you know, anything at work? You know, are you not performing as well because you're so tired because you stayed up at the casino or online watching the last sports game and then planning the next bets the next day so that you're only getting four or five hours of sleep and you're not doing well at work, right? Um, you know, there is um, there is the money piece too of that you're starting to, to experience some financial problems. That's, for many people, one of their first signs of like, oh my goodness, like I am either going to have to use my credit cards to make my monthly bills or, um, you know, I'm, I, I just am going to start skimping on some other things like other hobbies and activities start to, to drop away. And so the person's world starts to really shrink a little bit to or and they become a little bit more isolated. So those are some of your early signs. I mean, the other ones are, you know, you make promises about what you're going to do behaviorally. Like I I'm only going to take twenty dollars with me or I'm going to take one hundred dollars. That's my limit, you know, and soon enough. You go back to the ATM or you deposit more into the app and you're, you're losing control is what that was, what I would start to define that as. And so that's mm -hmm. the other big sign is you're setting these limits and you're, you're starting to violate them. Yeah. I mean, this, this sounds very similar to what we think of in terms of classic chemical addictions as well, right? Consequences, yeah. perhaps a lack of control around use patterns. Preoccupation I mean, begins to happen too. You start to think a lot about past gambling episodes or future gambling episodes. How am I going to get money to do this? Yeah. Well, so I guess along those lines, a question I get sometimes, I'd love to hear hear your explanation as well, is for, for we'll call them behavioral or process addictions like gambling. We, you know, we hear the same thing sometimes with shopping, with sex, with pornography. People are think, well, so there's no ex, you know exogenous chemical involved here, right? There's no alcohol. There's no there's administration no of the substance, yeah. Yeah. So, so how is it addictive? So how, how does this work for folks? I mean, what we know, and there's some really cool studies, these were done a while ago, is that, for example, gambling and cocaine have the same exact, generate the same exact reward response in the brain. So, you know, our brain uses dopamine um, to when we engage in rewarding activities, right? So when you, I like to use the example of hot chocolate chip cookies right out of the oven. You smell them. And then you eat them and it's like the best thing ever, right? That's dopamine. It's getting released left and right. Oh, my mouth is literally watering. Right? Why did it, man? Right? You got, you got it. Everybody on <laughs> release. You mean a hot chocolate chip cookie. It's why Doubletree gives you a hot chocolate chip cookie when you check in, right? It works. Yeah. It's great stuff, right? But when you then do, when you use cocaine, the amount of dopamine that is released in when you administer that substance is 20, 30 fold of compared to that. Like sex is also another activity when you orgasm, there's a lot of dopamine being released, but cocaine is much more a higher magnitude of that. We know from brain imaging studies that gambling activates that same reward pathway and almost to the same magnitude that cocaine does. Um, and so it, it's really this chemical process within the brain of reward. Um, it's really mm -hmm. thrilling to win money, right? Free money, because I mean, in a sense, in your brain, you're processing it as free money and it's rewards, you know, and so to win money. And the thing is, is when I talk to when you talk to people who struggle with gambling, it's almost not about the money anymore, but it is about the money. Right. You're chasing that big win, you know, or I'm yeah. just trying to get back to even. Sometimes that's the the what keeps it perpetuating itself. But um, it, it's this reward pathway in our brain. It's the only mm -hmm. rewarding activity in my life at this point because everything else has shrunk and dropped off. And, and the other activities that we do, it can't compete because the amount of dopamine getting released isn't anywhere near that magnitude. And the brain has become too used to, it's adapted to 
you know, instead of a droplet of dopamine being released, it's a it's a it's a cup being poured. And so then when you get that droplet of dopamine, meh, not so much. Right, right. So so there's these same chemical pathways, even yeah. if it's 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 created by behavior rather than than a substance. Mm-hmm. So here's a question then. So we, we have guidelines, for example, on like what does low risk drinking look like or mm-hmm. low risk use of other substances? What does that look like for gambling? How yeah. would someone know like if they were using it a you know, quote unquote safe level? Yeah. And so low risk is for for I think for me, that's always feels like a very academic or professional set of words. When I talk to clients, I talk about moderation, right? What does that look like? Right? So just to to use a little bit more of a, a word that we all might think we do have. Um, research on what is low risk limits for gambling. Um, and, and the thing is, it's not like there's, there's not like one thing, like with alcohol, we generally know it's like, okay, like this amount of alcohol with, with gambling, it's a little bit slightly different in that we think about time, money, and activity. So we know generally, and there's a couple, and money's a little bit funny because people have different economic situations based on, you know, how much money they earn. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's kind of two ways we kind of think about it. So it's generally speaking, about a hundred dollars a month is the is the monetary limit that you should risk and, and potentially lose. Um, or alternatively, you can say one to three percent of your gross monthly income. All right, that's another way to kind of think about it if you want to kind of look at it two different ways. So it's a hundred dollars a month, or no more than one to to three percent of your gross monthly income. We also say no more than about five to six episodes per month. All right. And then also it should be no more than two to three different gambling activities. So we know with people who struggle with gambling problems, they actually are doing, they're doing sports, they're doing uh, blackjack, they're playing poker, they're buying lots lottery and scratch tickets. So they're engaged in multiple forms of gambling. And so that's a marker sort of, of intensity. So um, those are our, our kind of behavioral sort of limits around moderation. Frequently, when I talk to individuals um, who come in to see me for treatment, and they they're like, "I'm not ready to stop gambling." You know, can I engage in moderation? And well, and we can talk more about that down the road. But I tell them these behavioral limits, and they're like, "Well, that's just getting started, right?" Yeah. Like, well, that's no fun. Like, what's the point of doing that? And I'm like, "Well, that's what what gambling when it's healthy and it's normal. That's what gambling looks like." So, right. um, yeah. So that's that's the definition there. Yeah, well, I think that's very helpful that that one to three percent and, you know, how what's the variation look like? What's the frequency? Because then you at least have have an anchor point you mentioned yeah. motivational interviewing earlier on uh, in the show. And and I'm just thinking about some of the studies we have around like motivational enhancement therapies and MI, even just giving personalized feedback of like, hey, here's kind of like a, they did in that experiment. Right. Here's where you fall in that normal distribution. How do you feel yeah. about that? Mm-hmm. Um, what's that your can be really powerful. It is. I've done a lot of um, treatment with that. And with gambling, what's really interesting to do, especially now because it's if you're using an app, all this information is on your phone. You can sit yeah. there and add up how with 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 objective information. So 100 percent accurate information. How much money have you risked and lost over the past month? You can have and you yeah. can go back two months, three months and sit there and compare that against your monthly income. Compare that against your your priorities in life, you know. Like, what are the important yeah. things that you really care about? You know, is this a reflection of your priorities? Oh, I'm like, imagining like, like conversations there when you do that. Yeah, well, I'm imagining like this, this would never happen, but I'm imagining there would be an app where on the app, you'd have like a little ticker of the amount of money risked, the amount of money lost, and then also perhaps the probability that you would ever actually win it back. You know, if you're yeah. in the room. Like, I, I mean, you. They, I think we're going to be eventually moving towards giving people feedback on how much yeah. you've lost and how much you've risked. Um, the other thing that I love to do is time divided by how much you've lost. So you mm. sit there and you add up the amount of time that you've spent on this app and then you divide it by how much money you've lost. So there's your losses oh, per hour. And then yeah. you compare it to how much you make per hour. Right. And, it, and it's just eye opening for folks because many individuals with a gambling problem, um, by the time they develop a problem, they have stopped really. They avoid attending to that information because sometimes that information can create feelings of guilt and shame. So they don't want to do it. But we have to take a look at this just to see. So we know what the situation is so that we can start the conversation of 
where are you today? Hmm. And where do we want to go tomorrow? I, I love that framing of, of the like money loss per hour, you know, so you could actually think about it more uh, d discreetly, like I know in uh, in say the alcohol world, oftentimes it can be useful to think, okay, so how much money are you spending on this a month? Or if they're yeah. concerned, say about health or weight, um, you know, like how many calories have you intake in all likelihood? Yeah. What does that look like? And that large number can be uh, shocking, but it's yeah. also like large numbers sometimes don't feel as personal or as proximal as if you're like, if you do this for an hour, this is the expected loss, right? Yeah. And you can just see that one to one. Cost. And this is and this is what's happened over the last month. I'm not making these numbers up. This is for yeah. real the number, you know. And then it's also fun sometimes. I mean, I say fun in this context of being a therapist, like to sit there and then multiply that that monthly number. Let's times it by twelve. Let's times it by twenty four. Let's times it by sixty. So one one year, two years, five years. You know, let's times it by one hundred twenty. Let's see what happens if you were to sustain this pattern of behavior. Over 10 years, how much are you going to lose? And and pretty quickly for many people who experience gambling problems, you're getting to a seven-figure number. And, right. and for right. them, it's like, oh, my gosh. And we just, is this sustainable? You know? Right, right. Is this well, and it can be very, and I, I appreciate that you brought up that there's that line, right, between it's not about shaming. And if yeah. someone edges in that direction, we got to try to help them with that. But it, it can be very motivating if someone looks at that and says, wow, I feel a lot of dissonance looking at that really big number in comparison to my values or my responsibilities to my family. Mm -hmm. And it's not meant to shame. You know, yeah. lots of people with gambling um, experience guilt and shame. And shame is this emotional experience where you, which leads to avoidance, to hiding and concealing. And and I never want that from for the people I work with. We never want that for people experiencing gambling problems. Like, yes, you've done potentially something very bad and harmful in the sense that you may have damaged your financial future and that of your and your partner didn't know about that. And so that there are some, you know, sometimes we, you know, I'm borrowing a, a word from um, that we don't use yet in the gambling literature, but I think applies is moral transgression. Um, you know, it comes from the domestic violence literature where, where you have somebody who's a perpetrator of violence on another person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not exactly physical violence, but where when you drain your 401k and your spouse had no idea that and they were counting on that for retirement, you know, that that that's a big event that is very defining. And so we, yeah. we have to figure out how to navigate that situation sometimes, too. I mean, that's the yeah. thing with yeah. by the way, like um, there are people who are in that situation, but there are people who haven't yet reached that position and hopefully they've come come to our door before that or they've changed by themselves. We know many individuals also are able to stop gambling on their own. Some people need some extra little help and there's no shame in asking for help too. That's another piece where shame sometimes comes in where they feel like that, that would be shameful to ask for help. And it's like, no, like sometimes we all need a little boost. We all need a little support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's particularly if the way that I like to frame it usually is if you look at your trajectory around an issue or a problem and you're seeing it, it certainly if it's if it's uh, going down, that's worth noting. But even if it's just holding steady in a bad place and it's not where you want to be, yeah. sometimes you get that extra that extra bump and it gets you over the top. Yeah. And, and little change leads to bigger change. So speaking of the bump. How, what does best practice gambling treatment look like these days, both in terms of like from on the clinical side, how do we go about working with it, but then also from more the consumer side from someone who is potentially either evaluating programs or therapists or you know, trying to find help, like what, what should we be looking for around treatment? So there's a, a variety of options out there. And I, I like to think of it as sort of a, almost a bouquet that you're going to be creating. There's different flowers that you can put together because what works for one person also may not work for somebody else. And so we have to, and so that's also where I bring in the pizza analogy. Everybody has their favorite pair of, um, favorite pizza place. And I may not agree with you about what's the, where's the best pizza in town or, um, you know, sometimes clothing, right? What the, the, the shoes that fit and work for me don't fit and work for you. So we, we have to kind of take a, there's lots of options and you got to find the option that works for you. So first off on the, on the lower end of sort of intensity, depending on what, how much you want to gauge. I mean, I think of gamblers anonymous is an, a wonderful resource out there that I, that's one of the things I always play. It's free. It doesn't cost money. And there's online and in-person meetings in your local community where it's a bunch of people who, who struggle with the same issue and you can walk in the door 
and you can just, it, you know, you're in a room with a bunch of other people who are struggling with the same thing. And that can be really powerful and a source of connection when you otherwise are isolating and withdrawing and avoiding, you know. And so here's a place where you actually can be very real and just get some social support around your situation. Um, so I, I like to just always plug 12 step stuff. Sometimes there are um, it doesn't people don't connect. And I tell them, like, you got to try three different meetings because the first meeting, not all 12 step meetings are the same. So you got to try different things. Um, you know, it's a free resource. There are also other online sort of um you know, support groups out there. Um, and so if, if the 12 step stuff isn't exactly for you, sometimes people are like, well, I don't really want to talk about God. Um, they have a problem around that. And I'm like, well, that's fine. You know, so there's a place, uh, there's a website called gamblers and recovery.com. Um, and that's another free resource again. And they have some 12 step, like they have support meetings, self-help meetings where people can go. Um, other sort of self-help materials that, you know, this is on the consumer side, not necessarily, there's no evidence base for, you know, our, our research around GA is very limited. So, but we know the 12, the AA for alcohol um, problems, you know, we know that there's some efficacy there. So I don't have problems generalizing over to Gamblers Anonymous. Some people mm -hmm. um, in the community on um, the consumer side really like Alan Carr's book, How to Stop Gambling. Um, he's a whole series on other how to stop addictive behaviors, but um, some people in the community really tend to like that book. It's about putting up barriers in the way of money. Um, is some of the basic information he provides, um, but it, it's a useful book if if that's what you want. It's a starting a starting place. Um, you know, another great starting place if you're thinking like, man, I might need to do something about this. Is each each state has their own um, problem gambling helpline. Usually, it's one eight hundred Gambler, but there are um, New York and um, New York is the one state that has a different number. Um, but you know, if you just type in problem gambling helpline, you'll find your local one. Um, it's usually run by your state council on problem gambling. Um, each state has a slightly different name for their, their council, but they have lots of great state level resources for your local area, including they may be able to put you in contact with free treatment, um, you know, by a provider who's familiar with people who struggle with gambling disorder. They have some sort of training and background in working with these individuals um, who struggle with gambling problems. And so um, that's a resource that's really wonderful is the, the helplines. As a, as a starting place more on the consumer side. From the research and as the as a therapist you know, side is, you know, the first thing I like to talk about when I'm talking about treatment as a therapist is on the therapist side, I'm a generalist. You have to, we know that comorbidity, so other psychological disorders are common. It's the rule. It's actually having only a gambling disorder is the exception. It's like 96% have at least one other disorder. 66% have two or two or three other disorders, the depression, anxiety, other, other addictions. So substance use disorders are the most common smoking cigarettes. 70% uh, of people who have a gambling problem smoke cigarettes. So one of the reasons why casinos don't like to ban smoking, by the way, um, because it, it meet, there's two competing addictions here, gambling and smoking. Smoking always wins out after 90 minutes and they go and take a break and it's time away from the machine. So as and so then also as a generalist, so so I have to be able to work with people who have or, um, several potentially other psychological disorders on board, depression, anxiety. Many individuals also potentially have a history of trauma, right? So gambling, you have to be able to assess for, understand, affects all walks of life. So I have to have good background in issues of diversity. So I have to understand or cultural humility of understanding people, you know that. You know, individuals from Asian backgrounds, gambling is very normative within their culture and it's supported and encouraged. And all of a sudden you're going to have to go tell this, your family that you have a gambling problem. And that also may bring shame to the family. So I have to understand some of those pieces along the ways. Or if you come from a very religious background where gambling is still a sin, there's some issues there mm -hmm. that I have to be aware of. And so, but also, can you lean into your faith at all? So um, you just have to be very much um, have a broad lens. And then I generally, you know, we know motivational interviewing is a wonderful place to start. And for some people on the less severe end, it's actually it's a it, it can be the stopping point for treatment. We also know, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, has a strong evidence base. It's the you know gold standard currently for that. Um, there's a range of what we do within CBT. Um, you know, some of it with what's unique to, for therapists who are listening, you know, what's unique for gambling compared to CBT for other addictions is you, you need to spend a little bit of time on, um, 
basically, we don't have a great word for it, but we've used the word irrational beliefs, maladaptive cognitions around basically feeling lucky, feeling like I'm due to win. You know, that machine's going to be hot. You know, I like the slot machine at the end, the end cap at the end of the row versus the one in the middle because I know they want to see people walking by and have big wins. So I'm only bet on those machines. So they have these, you know, erroneous beliefs is another word. There's gambler's fallacy where you can only recall the big wins. And so we got to spend a little bit of time on that, which is different from other addictions, you know, and we know as severity increases in problem gambling, that the severity of those, how firmly and how many of those beliefs you have expand. There is a CBT version that's straight up cognitive that focuses just on dealing with those. And it's efficacious, you know. There's other ones where you do the more um, classic cognitive behavioral, which is much more behavioral, where you're identifying triggers and, and doing a functional analysis, where you look at what are the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. So what's the pattern of gambling and how do we interrupt that pattern, both behaviorally, or if we can't interrupt the pattern, how do we cope with these situations and things like that? Mm -hmm. I've given so you a it lot sounds of like I'm going to pause. Yeah, yeah, well, I've, I've got I've got a follow up that I have as well in, in in mind. But just thinking about more on this therapy side, so it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, one, there's uh, there's almost always some sort of uh, underlying emotional reason why people are gambling, and mm -hmm. addressing that's important. But two, that although there are these context specific elements of treatment around gambling disorders there's this core element of CBT that if a therapist didn't view themselves as an addiction specialist or a gambling specialist, it's not that they'd be unqualified to work with an individual. They just might have to do a little bit of additional study, get some resources, and it would be well within their ability to, to work with somebody. I, 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 I truly believe that if you are, if you feel like you're a competent cognitive behavioral therapist, that you can do gambling treatment. Yes, you're going to have to go do a learn, learn a little bit more. And there's, and there's some things that you may just straight up have to ask your client. And there is no shame, and I go back to that word, right, where you're just going to have to ask them to educate you. You may not understand the, what a parlay bet is, right? And you'll just say, can you explain that to me? I'm not exactly familiar with that. Well, I am an expert. And what, what I frequently say to clients is I may not be an, exact, an expert on your exact situation, but I'm an expert on behavior change, right? And so if you have that idea and that mantra, and you're open to doing a little bit more learning, you know, um, there are some good primers that are available if you go on like PubMed or Google Scholar where you just type like if you type in the word gambling primer there's two articles that will come up that are very helpful that just give you the quick lay of the land you know written mm -hmm. by very well respected academics yeah yeah well and I, I think de demystifying as and encouraging folks like you, you not only can you screen for these problems talk about these problems but you could work with them you know you, yeah. you do have to get some additional information but it's yeah. not this huge mountain or you have to yeah. refer out to a specialist one, mm. one more question and this is something oftentimes like when when folks call me a lot of times it's not uh, the, the person with the gambling problem themselves, it's a family member who's yeah. very concerned or they don't know what to do. They don't know how to approach it. Mm -hmm. How how do you work with that situation in terms of how do you help a concerned family member speak to their loved one about this issue in hopes of getting them to find a you know, interface with help? Yeah. So there's a great protocol out there and it's um, it originally comes from the alcohol world. I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, but it's been validated and examined in the context of gambling disorder, val adapted and you know found to be efficacious. So uh, it's the community reinforcement and family therapy approach called the craft approach. And, and you know, it, as you know, it, it really helps the family member. One, you know, we have to assess the family member to make sure they're safe, right? They're, they're not in a situation where if they start talking to the the identified person with a gambling problem that it's going to create like a situation of domestic violence or otherwise threaten their safety. Um, but then two is, is talking about enabling behavior. So um, it frequently happens where they're bailing them out financially or they're not, they're, they're, they're setting up situations where they cover for them if they're not making events or doing things, or if they lose their job because they embezzled money at work, that, that they pick up extra hours at work shifts so that they can make the money whole and things like that. We have to, you know, even though they're tied to this person, you know, financially, emotionally, legally, that you need to start to allow them to experience the natural consequences of their gambling behavior, that you can't protect them from those consequences because those consequences are what's going to lead to behavior change. Um, and then mm -hmm. it's how does, and then it's a lot about how do you start the conversation of saying, I'm really concerned about your gambling behavior and about your well being. Like, I really think it's time we sit down and address this. And so that's the other part that as a therapist that I do with them and, and helping them scaffold that conversation 
And the goal is basically to get the person into treatment. So I use that one a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, It's interesting with gambling. I frequently use it with parents who are older and have a, 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 a son, sometimes a daughter, but primarily a son who's in their 20s and 30s. Right. And, you know, they they discover there's this huge gambling problem and they're trying to step in to make sure that, you know, they don't lose their housing and, and other and other bad things. And, you know, I have to talk to them about like Mama Bear has to take a step back. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I know you love your son or your daughter. I know you love your child. Um, and this is going to be really hard to watch sometimes. And I use the analogy of watching a child run down the sidewalk really fast and you know that they may fall and skin their knee but you need to have let that happen but also at the same time you know if you see the child running and they're going to make go turn and run down into the street and the car's coming down the street you do have to grab them right to prevent you know a, a bad injury or accident from happening and so but where is that line what is your marker of of this uh, or a symptom or, or whatever it may be that says what is the event that where you then like i have to step in to make sure you're safe um, yeah. And that those are those are long and challenging conversations and, and heartfelt. Yeah, well, I, I, absolutely. But but having that having that clear in your mind, understanding that that interplay in the system and how to make sure that someone feels those natural consequences. I, I completely agree. That's one of the hardest things, I think, to mm-hmm. let happen to someone you love is have them experience discomfort when you think you could prevent that yeah. from, from occurring. And that but they get upset with you for allowing the natural consequences to happen. Yeah. How do we navigate that? You know? Right. Even if it's what's healthy, healthy in the long run. Yeah. Well, so, so final question before we finish up here, but with an eye to the future. So we, we've, we've covered a really broad range today. We talked about history. We talked about more of like the, the financial and corporate ecosystem. We've talked about the personal, um, for those of us who look at problem gambling, and in particular here, the rise of problem gambling here in Problem Gambling Awareness yeah. Month, and think, okay, like there are, there are potentially areas here where we could, where, where we could stop the, the degree of harm that we're seeing happen right now occur, where we're seeing rises in use, where you've got, you know, mobile apps that now allow you to use, lose tremendous amounts of money from your bathroom, essentially where that wasn't available yeah. in the past. <laughs> are, are there areas where you're looking at this whole paradigm and thinking there's, there's a soft spot here where we might actually be able to make a difference. If someone listening was thinking, I would really like to try to make some difference in my community or state, even federally, what's, is there an opening right now where we can help? I think there is a lot of openings in a lot of different places. So it's kind of where do you believe and have connections that you think you can to, to do? And, and I was never trained in advocacy. I think that's what you're starting to talk about. And, and as a psychologist, we're starting to realize we need to step up that part of our game, you know, um, and, and engage in some advocacy work. I think w- there's there's a whole, di- whole lots of different av- opportunities um, to get involved of, of, you know, local prevention councils of just saying, hey, what about problem gambling? You know, if you have a local public health, you know, you know, every county has like a public health department and just call them up like, what are you doing to prevent problem gambling? You know, and like, can I be a voice for that? And and what are we doing to destigmatize problem gambling? You know, are you doing any efforts there? So you can definitely have and there are, there are fantastic people around the country who are starting to do this work. Um, there's a guy, his name's Jim Corn. He's out in California and he has received money from the state of California office of problem gambling. They have one of those. Um, and they, he gets money and he takes high school students and he teaches them how to do public service announcements and it's focused on mm-hmm. gambling. And, and these are kids who are just from local high schools. Like they don't have any connection to gambling. Right. And he has and he does this across the state. I don't know if he's still doing, it, but this is like 10 years ago. He's doing this across the state. And you have like 30 or 40 different kids who, you know, uh, units of kids, groups of kids doing these public service, creating public service announcements around problem gambling. So the kids would go learn about problem gambling. They learn how to do PSAs and what makes them effective. They would create their own PSA. And then you bring them all together cool. for a showcase. Like, I mean, yeah. so that's like big picture, like lots of there's some money there, all that. But that has real effect because you're you're think about all the ripple effects of all those different kids now knowing about problem gambling and it, it ripples through their community and as they yeah. grow in age. But 
you know, but even if you do that at one county, that has an impact. You know, I think there's um, there's state councils on problem gambling. They're always looking and open to people who want to volunteer and work with their organization. And there's a lot mm-hmm. of different like problem gambling crosses a lot of different areas. We, we haven't even talked about suicide today and gambling and suicide frequently co-occur. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, I do some trains on gambling and suicide. And lately when I do it for states, I always ask them. Can I, can your suicide prevention person come in and do the last five minutes to talk about local resources? So looking for avenues to partner with people who are already doing some of this work, but just bring in gambling, like just bring in mm-hmm. like we're, you know, that sort of thing. And and so there's a lot of different opportunities. If you have an addiction prevention council or, or things like that at the local level, you know, yeah. there is opportunity also at the state level as your state's thinking of if they haven't legalized sports betting yet, um, there's still some states who haven't my state included, is to talk to your state legislature, to talk to the representatives and say, like, I'm concerned about problem gambling. What are you doing about that? You know, are, are we setting up a system here to help those people, to identify those people, to destigmatize? Like, what are you doing on the prevention and treatment side? And also, what are you doing just to monitor the situation? You know, are you doing some studies mm-hmm. within your within you know, your state to say, like, how big of a problem is this? Because in fact, New Jersey did it has done a, a recent prevalence study as part of their sports betting thing. They have to assess it every three to five years. I don't know the exact timeline. And they found that there's an, actually an increase in problem gambling in their state compared to the national prevalence numbers, mm-hmm. like five or six percent. And they're like, wait a second, where is this coming from? You know, right. and, that, and so having that monitoring is going on. And, and is your state doing that? And if you if you want to go at the federal level, I mean, I can tell you NIH, the National Institutes of Health, does not fund gambling disorder research directly hmm. um, and there's reasons for that but there's those can be overcome and and the other big mental health agency with this also a partment of that's also a part of the Department of Health and Human Services is SAMHSA substance abuse mental health service administration they don't do much at all about gambling yeah. and so if you know people and you can connect there and help us there's also the armed forces there are hmm. slot machines on foreign on military bases that are in foreign countries. And veterans, we know, you know, active duty military, they have the same, they have an increased risk for a gambling problem because the underlying sort of characteristics of being, you know, a lot of military have trauma in their life and their background based on where they're coming from and their, their yeah. you know, experiences growing up. And so there's a lot, like, so if you're involved with your veteran community, you know, what's going on with gambling in my community there? Like, let's talk about this. So there's always ways to, if you're in the mental health field, are there ways you can bring gambling into what you're doing today? is the bottom line that I would say and start yeah. local and work your way up. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was a very comprehensive answer and I, and I agree with you. I think it all comes back to how do we use our voice and, and we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. There are these resources wow. around. Although I, I think it is, it's a really good point that there's almost like this carve out around gambling from other addictions where just, you know, thinking about yeah. even like youth, youth prevention organizations, right? The way grants are written says it has to be on substances, even if gambling is an issue, like that wouldn't fall within the, you couldn't no. spend grant funding on, on on addressing it. And I think that actually acknowledging, no, this, this is actually an issue too, and it's becoming more of one. And we shouldn't be like saying, but you can't talk about that. Like that yeah. feels like a dated way of looking at it. It is very, and then I have to say that you bring up adolescent and youth gambling, and like that is one of my biggest fears because they're they're being saturated. Whenever you watch any sports, with all this betting, marketing, and yeah. advertising, and so while they can't legally bet because the, the age is, legal age is twenty one, they're betting among their friends, and they can't wait till they turn twenty one to start making bets, and and we're just creating a new norm about what's acceptable, and and, and maybe I'm old, and maybe I'm just kind of stodgy, but like. Although really loot boxes, right? There are loot boxes and games that they can use yes, even right now. Yes, we can now. talk about adolescent gambling <laughs> and that loot boxes, which are these things that basically it's, it's a slot machine. It's variable ratio reinforcement. Yeah. They deliver a prize that may or may not be helpful to you in your gameplay, and you don't know what you're going to get, and um, it costs money, whether it's in-game money or money that you actually put into the game. Oh, yeah. So that's a whole yeah. nother <laughs> 50. Yeah, we're, we're of socializing all of the, the games that you can download from the Play Store or the Google, the, the apps, you know, the Apple Play Store, the Google one and Steam. 50 percent of them have uh, gambling features with embedded in those games and the top 100 games yeah. that people download. So it's, and there's no warning that there's gambling on there and they have and all of them are most of them are available to kids. 
right so, 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 so you time. have to be 21 to do certain types of gambling but not other types yeah, of gambling you're supposed that... to gambling at a young age and we just know generally the earlier age that you're exposed to an addictive object earlier you start drinking even just the one a sip of dad's beer the earlier you start doing that the more likely you're going to develop um, an addiction so an alcohol problem gambling problem marijuana problem you name it yeah it's, it's almost <laughs> like this is very well known yet we're still doing it well we're <laughs> sticking our head in stand a little bit around like <laughs> yeah but well hey I, we could probably talk about this for another hour easily it seems like yeah. but we got we got to wrap things up for today thank you so much for all of your thought your insight your expertise if there was a if there was a way to stick the landing something you'd like to end on a, a message for <laughs> listeners what what would it be it's just to have compassion for people who are struggling with a gambling problem. Really, I mean, and, and, and empathy. It's that no one sets out to, to go destroy their lives financially. No one decides one day, like, oh, that's a great idea, right? It, among, you know, that they, they end up in this spot, you know, and, and sometimes very quickly, sometimes it just grows over time, but they're in a bad spot. And it's just to have empathy for their suffering. Individuals with a gambling problem are really suffering and and that's the message I want to kind of just share is the the landing spot of here is no one chooses this and it's it's a really awful place. Yeah. Well, they're they're lucky to have someone like you on their side. And uh thank you again. Really appreciate it that you came on the show today. And and thank you for the opportunity. This is wonderful and it it raises awareness around the issue.